So, welcome back. Before starting the multivariate part, I would just like to hear how did everything work out with the simple linear regression models. From what I saw, pretty much everyone was making good progress. Um, did anyone not get where they wanted to get? Have I not finished anything? That's, uh, that's okay. Um, but it sounds like I want to continue and then get to something we can discuss it afterwards. So, let me just change this one. One thing is when things are actually linear when you start looking at it. In other cases, when things are not linear, and then you can do multiple things. Either you can transform the dependent or the independent variables. Both things are eligible. You should remember to when you're comparing models and stuff like that, if you are changing the scale of some kind for the dependent variable, either by changing the number of observations or by changing the transformation of that, then you cannot readily compare anything like p-values or other things between the two. What you have to look into is to find the one where the assumptions, say the QQ plot to test for normality of the residuals, are fulfilled the best. So you should find the transformation that gives you the best compliance with the assumptions. Whereas if you change the independent variables, say adding a second order term in, in some model somewhere, that is not a problem. That you can do if you like to, um, and then you can still compare. It's just using another predictor. So often when you start to do transformations, what you've seen me doing is to do the log transform. And maybe now is the time to explain what actually happens when you do that. <coughs> so we all know, I hope, how log of x looks like. Something like this. This is in 1. So do you also recall what is the solution, the first order derivative of log of x? It's exactly, it's 1 over x. And why is that important? Well, what we looked at over here is that when you multiply by a constant in here, what you do is that you multiply by the constant square to get the variance, right? So what happens over here when you take a function of something? That depends on whether you're here or you're over here. Because effectively you have a slope here corresponding to the first order derivative. So the variance of a function of a stochastic variable x is equal to the first order derivative evaluated at the x value that we want to have, square times the variance of x. So now if we use the log of x as our function here, it means that the variance of the logarithm of our stochastic variable x is 1 over x square times the variance of x. So what happens is this x square here means for larger values of x, this would be a large number, so the variance for large numbers of x will be reduced, whereas the variance for numbers that are smaller than 1 will be increased. So the relative variance will be shrunken from one side and extended in the other side, in the low end. So that is what happens when you do the log transformation. Another alternative is to do the square root. Then you get a square root and a factor. A constant factor doesn't really matter how here. But that means that you get something that scales with 1 over x when you take the square of the square root, 1 over the square root. 
So therefore, when you do this gravel transformation, it's a milder transformation. It still does the same thing, that the variance is reduced for large values and increased relatively for smaller values, but the log is the more aggressive one in that sense. You can also, so that's pretty much when you do the dependent. Sometimes you want to do it at the inverse or the square or the cube or whatever polynomial you want to do. If you get up to a high polynomial order for your explanatory variables or predictors, then you may want to consider what's called orthogonal polynomials. But that's another story. I won't, I just mention it. So if you want to, you can dig into it. So when we do multiple linear regression, it's pretty much just like simple linear regression. In simple linear regression, we had just two variables that we were estimating. We had a constant alpha, and then we have a slope beta as per default. In R, what happened there? Basically, what we have there is that we have a column, we have some ones, and then we have all the values say, all the distances that we measured in the Hubble case. So, what happens here is just you add some more predictors. It's not rocket science. Basically, what happens in internally... Ah, oh, I should have this one with... When you fit a simple linear regression model, what you do is you have this model here, and what you do is that you write it all on matrix vector form. So you take all your observations, y1, y2, down to yn. And then that's equal to something. And then we have the parameters here, alpha and beta, and then plus a vector here that contains all the residuals, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon n, and the ones in between. Now, in order for this to work, for every i time point here, then what I need as my first row, corresponding to my first observation, is a 1 for the alpha, and then I need the x1 here. Likewise, I need a 1 and an x2 and a 1 and a xn. And everything in between. So that is actually how you can write, this is called the design matrix. Get back to that in further detail tomorrow in another context. So. What happens here if you want to add an extra variable? Well, basically, you just add an extra parameter there and you add an extra column here. Then the way you solve it, I won't go through the theory, but basically, the estimate here, if we call this theta, this vector here, the estimate of that is, and if we define this whole thing as just x, it's x transpose, x, you take the inverse of that, and then you have x transpose y. So, x transpose x inverse, that says something about the precision of what we have. So, what matters in order to get a good estimate for a, in a simple linear regression is how much of how far spread out are our x's. If all our x's are in a narrow window, we have less information about the slope as opposed to if they are more spread out. Of course, it's all relative to the variances. But that's the estimator, and it works also if you add more columns to it. So that is what happens, you could say, numerically. Not exactly like this when you implement the computer, but it's, that's the game. So, the challenge when you do multiple linear regression is that you have to do, be careful when you make inference. And why is that? Now, if your different x's in here have correlation, that means you have the correlation structure in your x transpose x matrix down there. 
and now you, what you do when you do the model selection is that you start removing variables that are not significant. So you have to condition on what did you take out from the model. Because maybe that was something that you, it was not statistically significant, it might still make physical meaning. So always say this is what is in, but also what, I, what you took out. And a challenge is so-called multicollinearity. That is when things are very correlated, then you may have challenges. Sometimes, even though things are correlated, you need to have both variables in there because even though they're correlated, they do explain something. But sometimes it's not needed because it's effectively the same. And that's what I want to illustrate. First with a small example and then with a somewhat greater example. This is uh, some what I call the nuclear data set. It contains the cost of some nuclear plants, power plants, what is the power installed capacity, and what is the date and year. So this is over a five, a four year period in the late 60s, early 70s. A lot of power plants were built in that period. Um, how do you then kind of show an overview of what's happening here? The one thing that I prefer to do as the first thing is to do what is called a pairs plot. So I have costs, all these, pl those two plots there have the cost on the y axis, and then on the x axis you have the megawatt in this one and the date in that one. And you can see if you go around the margin, you can figure out it jumps around so you can to find the one that has the right axis. But here you can see everything that happens. So let's say that we are interested in the cost. What can we say? Is there anything here that kind of could be a dependence? I would say that at least here you have a lot of points in the lower left corner and you have points up in the upper right corner as well. So there's a tendency at least. Likewise, there's also a tendency that a larger plant, a power plant, is more expensive than a smaller one. That also makes somewhat sense. Now, on the other hand, it's sometimes difficult to look at, let me just add... When you have clouds of many points, this smoother I added here, that gives you a non-parametric smoother, called the Lois, if you know of it, otherwise just ignore that comment, um, for what is the tendency in the data compared in each of these combinations. One thing I did not say is if you look at this plot and look at that plot, when you go, you transpose, because what you do is that you swap X and Y axes. So sometimes it's you want to look primarily above the diagonal, sometimes you want to look at below. It depends on the order of your elements in your vector there. So this is a quick and easy way to plot all possible combinations of all the variables in there. At first I'll just do a simple linear regression model. Look at a summary before making too much. I, I notice that everything is significant, but before making inference, I will just check the residuals to see if things are somewhat well behaved. I see a horizontal line there. The QQ plot has been better, but also been worse. The scale location, you could say to some degree, it goes a little bit down. So for the larger fitted values, the variance is a little bit smaller but you don't have that many observations out here. So I think for now, we'll just leave it as is. Nothing is even near the Cook's distance. Uh, Christian, one of the TAs said, well, you can also, instead of using this plot, you can use one of the other plots where you only show Cook's distance. But personally, I like to have, I know it's a bit more complex, but having the leverage as well, so you kind of get in information about is this something that influences the estimate a lot or not so much? But 
since we're going into the multivariate, we'll try to do all of them. And effectively, it's the same as using dot at dot here. So what the dot does is that it says everything else, or everything that is there. So it means that since the data frame has three columns, and I ask for the cost as my response here, then it means when I have the dot on the right hand side, it just means take all the remaining variables and make that model. Now, I will add one thing to the summary. Again, everything here is quite significant. And the diagnostic plot is actually it's still the cost that is the response, but now the scale location plot goes a little bit upwards. Just to show, really, we added one more predictor, it helps somewhat, but it, there's nothing really to come for here. You can argue this one up here, it drops up quite a bit because there's one observation down there. The one with the largest fitted value has a large negative residual. That is also the point that is down here. Due to the scaling, it's difficult to see. Um, maybe if I do like this, you can see it's observation number 26. It's not crossing Cook's distance, so I won't do anything about it. I'll just leave it. But maybe some other day you want to just look into observation 26. Was that because they added a fancy skiing resort on top of it? Or what was the reason for that? So, the one thing from the summary here at the bottom, have the correlation of the different coefficients. And there's one thing there to notice, try to have a look at those three numbers. So which one is of most interest? So, is there anything there that kind of makes you raise an alarm clock, which is <laughs> you cannot not and they just say nothing. <laughs> you don't have an alarm clock ringing without any alarm going on. That, that's, that's cheating. <laughs> yes. So when you have a correlation that is minus 1.00, it's not minus 1 exactly, but quite close. Can you see why that happens? I think what we need to look at in order to explain that is the pairs plot. So it comes between the date and the intercept. So when you look at the range for the date, the range there is from 19 of 67 to 71, roughly. See that down here. So that means it's a fairly narrow range. But where does the intercept play? The intercept is playing its role out at date zero. So effectively what happens is we have some observations out here. I know you cannot see them, but that is where 70 is. And this is where zero is. And then you fit a linear regression model to this. Looks something like this. And if you consider the confidence interval for this line, It has this trumpet shape. So out here, there's a lot of uncertainty. Basically, if the slope is decreased, then the intercept is increased, and vice versa, thereby a negative correlation. So the negative correlation between a slope and the intercept is quite common when you have large, has a narrow interval of positive numbers. So. What would make this intercept more robust is to say that instead of having our reference value, reference time here, we can just change our time to have it somewhere near our observations. Basically, what we have to do is to make a 
a new plot where this is our reference time, then everything will be nicer because the uncertainty, the relative uncertainty will be much smaller. So there are many ways of doing this. You can do it in a data. What I've done is just to do kind of a, a rough thing, but maybe if you do it even better. Um, so what I did was to take the megawatt here, maybe just do the summary of the nuke. So the mean or median date is somewhere around 68.5. So I should probably use that 68.5 as a rough estimator. And for the power, the mean is 825 roughly. So using the mean values is giving you a better performance there. If you look at the correlations now, it's pretty much gone. Because what happens now is that since we re recentered our data, now the intercept is effectively representing the mean of all the observations. If you scroll up a little bit here, the estimate is 453. And the mean value is 461 of the costs. Of course, there's a little bit about how the points are placed, but, and we did not use the exact number, so therefore it's not the exact value, but that's the interpretation. I don't expect you to do this all the time, but what I do expect you to do is to consider what is your axis that you use. Say, for the sports case, you used, at least what I saw, years past 19 100 as your reference time. You could have used 1904, 1908, 190, and then you'd have the same problem. You're spanning some 80 years, but your reference time is 2,000 years ago. So think of your scaling of your parameters. Now, going back to the diagnostic plots, what we see here is a slight increase in the variance here. We could say that we don't want to do anything about it. We could also try to do something about it. Since it's not a large increase, what I want to is just to get a small reduction of the variance here relative to here. So I'll try to take a square root of the cost and do the same model. It didn't change a whole lot. So I will try to do the log as well and do the same plot. We still have this observation 26 that behaves a little bit out here. So nothing is really perfect here. So which of the QQ plot is actually then the, the nicer one? This one is, I think, quite nice. If you look at the lower tail, maybe I should... Uh, oh, I re or wrote the, the model. If you look at the lower tail down there, it gets closer to the line and then something odd happens here. So the square root root would probably be good in this case, but there's not much difference. When there's not much difference, it's okay to say, well, then I'll use the untransformed. Unless there's something, say, from physics that says, well, we need to transform things. But this observation 26, what happens if we leave it out? What do you think? Would you be happy with a QQ plot like this? I would say yes. Would you be happy with this line down here in the scale location plot being horizontal? Yeah, it doesn't get much better. Um, residual was a fitted top left plot there. Yes, looks quite good. Leverage plot down here. Nothing is even near Cook's distance, so this is actually a quite good model. If we wanted to, we could try to use one of the other variables as predictors. I'll skip that, but move on to the next example. 
It's the crime data set. It contains an awful lot of variables. So this is where multiple regression really has something to say. And let me just find... I did upload an overview of what they all are. And I should also have it here. Yes. So the first one R here, that's the crime rate, as in number of offenses reported to police per one million population. And then the age, the second one here, is the number of males of age 14 to 24 per 1,000 population. S is an indi indicator for whether it's a southern state, so we have one observation for each state in the US. So we have the southern versus northern. Ed means education, years of schooling times 10 for persons of age 25 or older, times 10 just to balance so everything are on a similar scale. Then comes X0 and X1, those are expenditure per capita on police by state and local government. X0 is in 1960 and X1 is in 1950. Nine. So it's two consecutive years. Expect those to be correlated. We'll see that in a moment. LF is labor force participation. M is number of males per 1,000 females. So most places there are more females. N is the state population size. NW is non-whites per 1,000. That has quite a large spread. U1 is unemployment rate of urban males per 1,000 for year for age 14 to 24. U2 is the same, but just for ages 35 to 39. And then we have the median transfer value of transferable goods and assets of family income in tens of thousands. <laughs> and last, the number of families per 1,000 earning below half of the median income. So earning low, less than half of the median income. How many are doing that? So that's the data. Any pr yes? You could do that, you can say... Because, I mean, just for fun, to make the, like, all the parameters weigh equally in the model, right? Because otherwise you just multiply some parameter by 10, it feels less uh, standardized. Yes, you don't have to standardize things, but what you have to be paying attention to is when you look at the estimate the parameter values you get, the numerical size of a particular parameter does not necessarily mean anything because the predictors may have different scales. So I think that's the one thing to be concerned with. If the predictors are on different scales, you should be cautious by just looking at the numerical value of the estimated parameters. Um, you can also have, if things are changing by orders of magnitude, then you should then you can run into problems, numerical problems. But if you just divide by a number or something like that, it doesn't change any p-values or anything like that. So it's mostly for numerical accuracy and it's for ease of interpretation. In this case, you can say pretty much everything except for the 0, 1 coded here has values of the order of 100 or ranging elites from something to hundreds. So they are in the same range, so to speak. And that's also why this one is scaled to be of the order of 100 instead of being out of 10. So they are actually fairly close. You can say some here are roughly a thousand. You could have changed that to be roughly a hundred. But it's also a matter of using variables that people can relate to. So it's fine to change to use either meters or kilometers or centimeters or millimeters maybe f as a measurement of some distance. But to use 10 meters as your unit 
would be odd for most people. So if you can, usually you would say, use any of the traditional measures that brings you within orders of magnitude is sufficient. So what I did now is a pairs plot. When you do a pairs plot with this many, it's a bit overloaded, right? So
Any uh, conclusions? <laughs> Any conclusions or just comments? Should I be satisfied or should I not be satisfied? Or so so? <laughs> so, satisfied, not satisfied, or so so? Can we do that? One, two, three. That was a 50% so-so and some satisfied and some I didn't hear. <laughs> and that's probably quite adequate for a good measure for this. So those of you who said so-so, what does that make you say so-so? So you have the QQ plot has some potential tails. And there's also, well, is the variance increasing, yes or no? You have some observations here that are dragging it up a little bit, and some here that has lower variance. I fully agree with those with that comment. Um, this one up here is, I mean, worthy of a textbook. This here, I mean, there's one point that is sticking out a little bit, but it's not hurting anyone. So. What would then be the next step to do? First of all, let me do one thing. This is for the car model. When it looks a little bit different from what you did yesterday. What I did was to do QQ plot, what we did for residuals on numbers yesterday, but now I do it for a linear model. What it does in this case is that it simulates by bootstrapping the width of this interval. So you can see it's a bit more wiggly than what we looked at yesterday, because yesterday it was mathematically correct. In order to get it to look nicer, there is a parameter here, and it was simulate, but reps, how many repetitions to use, the default is 100. I'll just do it with 1,000. And you can see whenever you do it again, it does change quite a bit. So, even though it's a nice function, you can also choose your response. <laughs> or you can increase, and then it just takes a little bit longer to calculate. So, it's very good when you, you kind of use the exact distribution. It's not as beautiful when you do it like this. Um, but now I've done sufficient number of iterations. So, looking at the QQ plot now, how do you find it? It's actually okay. There's one point that sticks out, but it's only a 95% interval. So, it's really not too bad. It could be better, I fully agree, um, but it's not too bad. So, what we could consider doing now uh, is to make a transformation of the response in order to kind of see if we can fix the scale location. Let me just do that. I did not plan that, but let's just do that. So what we'll do is to go up and take the first model, insert it here, and then we'll see what else we need. So let's try to run with the square root of the rate out there. I'll just reduce it, and then look at the summary of this model. It's quite similar to what we had before. We need to remove the U2 in this case still. Now everything appears to be significant. It's not the exact same selection as before, but it's many of the variables are the same. 
Now we should just make a plot. Let's go up here, rerun that code. Did it improve? I mean, it did improve down here in the sense that you got those two down there to move down a little bit. It is more horizontal than it was before. And the QQ plot is still not perfect, and the rest is nice. Maybe 0.29 is not as influential as it was before, but it's not doing too bad. That's one thing, if there's time some other day, I'll cover it, called the Box Cox transformation that can help you find the transformation that gives you the best approximation of the malady for the residuals. Get back to that, but for now, just play around with things. So, this model here, where's my mouse? There. This model here includes the expenditure of the one year with an estimated coefficient of 0.05. Now what happens if I manually just add the expenditure for the other year, for the previous year? And do a summary of this one. First thing to notice is that 0.05 becomes 0.08 now, but then you get a, a, the other one variable with a minus 0.03. The sum of those two is back to 0.05. So now you get one with a positive slope and one with a negative slope. That's quite common when you have things that are correlated. And you can see that the coefficients, the, the two particular coefficients have a correlation of minus 0.09 uh, minus 0.98, so a very high correlation as well. We can also say, well, what if we exchange the x0 with the x1 variable by adding x1 and subtracting x0, then there's nothing, no problems with correlation there, and then we get a slope for x1 that is 0 0.05, as in quite similar to what was there before. Now the question is, how do we pick between those two? What is obvious is that we should not include both, because when you include them both, they both become non-significant. And even now, we should remove the one that was excluded earlier in the, in the model building, the EX1, the previous year. That p-value is much greater than this one up here. So that's the easy way to look at it. You could also look at the AIC of the two models, if you like. These models objects here, LM3, for instance, contains a lot of different elements and we can also ask for the AIC of a model if we like. It's just a number, but let's look at the others. So which one is better? The first one, LM3, because it has the lowest AIC. I'm actually surprised to some extent that the last one is even worse than the using both because it has the same, it, I mean, this one has an extra parameter. So that's why it is increased, but this one has just the one that is very correlated. But that's how life is. Sometimes your intuition fails. In particular, when you do some of these things, it's nice to have intuition and you should be Cautious whenever things are not behaving the way you thought that they should be, it's a good time to double check things. But sometimes things are just there for a reason. That was, I think, what I wanted to say. Um, I have one comment to those of you who looked into the book. 
it has a preference of using a function called attach and detach. So what that is doing is whenever you t type a name down here for something, say LM3, how does R find your way its way around here? It uses a search And what it does is, it has different environments. So first it looks in the so-called global environment. That's actually where it is. Then it looks in the car package that I loaded. Then it looks in the xtable package that I loaded. And the xls package that I loaded and so, for, so forth. Down to the statistics package packages and so on. So whenever you type something, say plot, It will also show you. It will show you the content of that function. This one is a kind of a wrapper function that just says use method. It means what type of plot are you going to plot? That depends on which argument you give it. If it's a, an LM object, it will do something similar to this out here. If it is just a vector point, it will just show that. So that's where the object-oriented thing comes. So this is down in that area, but I could also define a variable here, say plot. Now, if I write plot now, I get the variable in the global environment. I can still say I want the one in the graphics by writing graphics and then triple colon. Then I can see that one that is ma masked down there. A similar thing It will still find the appropriate plot function here because, well, it didn't know the other, the one in the local environment there was not a function. But if I made it a function in the local environment, so scoping. How to figure out what happens where is um, without, even without using attach and detach, you should sometimes pay attention. Let me just remove this function here. So now it will use, it will kind of do the expected behavior. When you have a data frame, as we have up here, it's called crime. I can attach. the crime variable here. Now my search has added this crime. So before looking anywhere else, it looks in the global environment first and looks at a crime. That means I can take any of the variables, the column names, say EX1, and just use that as a variable that is defined. So right now, life is beautiful. I can make a linear model where I just use the names without specifying that the data comes from Cree, because now everything is defined. However, I cannot use the dot anymore, because there's no meaning of dot when you don't have a reference as a data frame with all the columns in. That's not the worst thing. The worst thing is now, EX1 here, I will give it the numbers from two to four. So what do I get with EX1? Now I have it in my global environment, I have a vector with the numbers from two to four, but I wanted to change the number in the data frame. I cannot easily do that. Then I can, then I have to go to Cree dollar EX1 and then put something into that. Let me just for Ah, uh, what should we do? How long, how many observations do we have in the Cree? It's almost there. There. 47. Ah, uh, that's difficult to make something. Let me just take the numbers from 1 to 47. 
Now if I look at EX1, it's still this, but if I remove the one from the global environment, I still get that one, but if I look at So I got the one that was there before, but now I changed it and it's not reflected out here. So even though if you change it, basically what I'm trying to say is it's a nightmare if you don't know exactly how things are working. Of course, I'm on purpose stepping into some potholes, um, but I just do not recommend using attach. Um, also because then you attach it and attach it again because you're running some code again and again all of a sudden your search as in where to find things oops contains a lot of different data frames that it's trying to find its way through so I'll just detach and make sure I'm back to what is what I want to have. Only the global environment and log of pa packages. That's safe. Um, and it also, I find it makes things more transparent. And I hope I was able to com communicate that with this example I just showed you right now. Any questions? Otherwise, it's time to do a lot of multiple linear regressions. <laughs> 